Uh, I want to um, invite you for any questions that you may have uh, throughout this presentation to put it either in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, also, I want to thank Sierra for doing all of the legwork on these lectures. Uh, it is very much appreciated. Thank you, uh, Sierra. And uh, now for our guest of the evening, we have Dr. Mona Fishbane. We are really delighted to have her. Uh, not many people talk about the mind and love, but tonight we will hear from Dr. Mona uh, Fishbane, who is a clinical psychologist in New Jersey and the former director of couple therapy training at the Chicago Center for Family Health. Dr. Fishbane lectures nationally and internationally and has published numerous articles on couple therapy, intergenerational relationships, and interpersonal neurobiology. Dr. Uh, Fishbane received the 2017 Family Psychologist of the Year Award from the American Psychological Association, the Society for Couple and Family Psychology, and the 2023 Distinguished Contribution to Family Therapy Award from the American Family Therapy Academy. Also, Dr. Fishbane is the author of the book, Loving with the Brain in Mind, Neurobiology and Couple Therapy. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Fishbane. Thank you, Marlene. It's a pleasure to be here. I love teaching at Ackerman. Um, I've, I've, I trained with Olga Silverstein back in the 1980s. She was an Ackerman um, um, teacher, and uh, I just feel very close to the Ackerman community. So it's a great honor to be here. Um, this invitation to be part of the Ackerman Distinguished Lecture Series is really a great opportunity for those of us invited to reflect on our legacy over a professional lifetime, You know, like what matters. Distinguished connotes being an elder. Um, as a young therapist, when I was a beginning a, a therapist, I was young, I had red hair, long red hair, which I pulled back into a bun so I could look older and more experienced than I really was. And I thought someday I'll have gray hair and wisdom. <laughs> I've been working on wisdom ever since and I've got the gray hair. I'm still learning. I grew up with the field of family therapy. I had many wonderful teachers whose wisdom I've tried to integrate into my own approach. I'd like to share before beginning my presentation some of the key ideas that matter the most to me. One is couples' dances of reactivity. Why are they so persistent, so painful? What fuels them? Um, in 2004, Michelle Schenkman and I published an article in Family Process about the vulnerability cycle. Michelle, by the way, is, I believe, the next speaker in this series in March, which is wonderful. And uh, Michelle and I worked really hard on that article trying to capture the couple's dance, the intrapsychic process, the intergenerational process, and the larger sociocultural context. How when we try to protect ourselves, when we feel um, vulnerable, our survival strategies are activated, which in turn often activates our partner's vulnerabilities and then their survival strategies. The couple often become caught up in a vicious cycle of reactivity, and that's what I wanna look with you at tonight. What fuels this cycle? We look at the personal history, the family of origin, sociocultural factors. And also I try to look at the neurobiological factors fueling this reactivity, which I'll share with you. The family of origin is a particular interest of mine. I have a lifelong interest in intergenerational family dynamics. When I first went to graduate school at UMass Amherst in 1971, I was introduced to the work of Ivan Bozier Meninaj. Um, and I haven't looked back. I continue to rely on his wisdom. Part of um, Nanja's work is about not only understanding old wounds from the family, but trying to heal them, help clients heal them. And he's very strongly committed, as I am, to not blaming parents, not blaming our clients' parents for their issues, but to try to extend understanding to the parents as well. So we have the couple's dance or the cycle, including vulnerabilities and survival strategies, the family of origin roots, of the dynamics, the sociocultural context, and the interpersonal neurobiology about the reactivity. I don't see clients just as a bundle of problems or survival strategies. I see them as persons with values, aspirations, goals, and hopes. I try to tap into their positive energies and identify who they want to be and how their relationship they want it to look like. 
I help clients reach for their best self. My goal is not to pathologize clients, but rather to bring forth and help them cultivate their own resilience. My latest interest is in relational ethics. How can we help clients reach for their best self, live according to their own higher values, cultivating fairness, kindness, compassion, and generosity, even as they become more adept at speaking their concerns to each other and making room for both voices. So these four areas of concern, the vulnerability cycle, intergenerational factors, interpersonal neurobiology, and relational ethics, all in the context of sociocultural stressors and resources, are the areas I've written in and taught, developing theory and practical interventions, helping my clients become more empowered in their relationship. And we're going to look at power and how I understand it. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself beyond what Marlene kindly said about me. Um, first of all, I'm married for four, 54 years to the same guy. I got really lucky. <laughs> and uh, we also worked really hard on our relationship all these years. Um, professionally, my interests are primarily around couple and intergenerational um, family therapy. And my work is integrative. I don't believe that any one approach has all the answers. So I integrate psychodynamic, family systems, intergenerational, emotion-focused, narrative, and now interpersonal neurobiology. In search of wisdom, that's what I'm always looking for, especially these days. What does it mean to be a good human being, especially in an intimate relationship? What helps us flourish? What gets in the way? Why do partners get so reactive and polarized with each other? What impact does a larger societal context have on these processes? And how do values interact with couple dynamics? So um, I want to look at um, the idea of empowerment, the power to be your best self and live according to your higher values, not about the power to dominate another person. We'll get to that. Um, I wanna just con contextualize this socioculturally. We really have to take into account racism, homophobia, poverty, migration, war, so many things that are going on in the world today that shape our clients' reactivity and impact their emotional and physical well-being. It's not just the couple, it's not just the individual, and it's not even just the family of origin. Um, I'm also interested in what's their current context. Do they have children or not if they want to? Do they have jobs or careers that are working for them? How are, are they financially stable or stressed out? How is their physical and mental health? What prior relationships and losses have they had? So now I'm gonna um, screen share and, and go to my PowerPoint. So I just wanna uh, point out the, the title, which is From Reactivity to Empowerment. So that's the empowerment word. Interpersonal Neurobiology Meets Relational Ethics. The interpersonal neurobiology explains a lot about how we get so reactive and polarized in relationships. Um, it also explains how we can um, calm ourselves down and think about our higher goals, which is the relational ethics. So um, I want to tell you about my book. It's called Loving with the Brain and Mind, Neurobiology and Couple Therapy. I was really blown away and honored when Dan Siegel decided to write the foreword. Uh, it's part of the Norton series on interpersonal neurobiology, which Dan is the co-editor of. How did I get into this? I fell into the neuroscience world. Um, I went to a random, um, oh, webinar seminars, right? So you used to go in person to seminars, right, to get your CEUs. Sometimes we still do. But this was in the day before COVID where um, you, you could go to a seminar. I went to a Cape Cod seminar and I learned, just thought to pick the topic I knew nothing about. And it was on neuroscience and Alan Shore was teaching and I was completely blown away. And I haven't looked back since. Um, there's a neuroscience revolution primarily because of technology, especially fMRI scanners. Um, what neuroscientists have found is that nature and nurture are intertwined um, and they study genetics and also epigenetics, which we'll look at. Epigenetics is how your genes, which don't change from experience, are um, expressed through experience. So, for example, if you have a, pre a predisposition to depression and you're raised in a toxic home environment, you're more likely to be depressed as an adult. Uh, we also know epigenetics affects physical health. If you're living in, in poverty or in a, a, a smoke-filled uh, environment, you're more likely to develop cancer, for example. We now know that there's intergenerational transmission of trauma and also of epigenetic changes due to severe stress. We know this from Holocaust survivor families. We know this from uh, studies of black families uh, with the history of slavery and racism and other research. 
Um, what interpersonal neurobiology brings to the neuroscience conversation is it's your brain, that's the neuro, it's your body, that's the biology, and it's between people, the interpersonal neurobiology. It's not just the brain and your individual skull. We are social creatures interdependent throughout life. That's one of the most important findings. Neurobiology helps us understand brain body processes that get acted out in couple relationships, including the neurobiology of love, which we'll look at, the neurobiology of emotional reactivity, defensiveness and self-protection, how partners impact each other for better or for worse, both emotionally, psychologically, and also physically. The neurobiology of self-regulation, how can we bring our best self forward? The interplay between habits and change, which is a very important issue in, in therapy in general. Neuroscience teaches us why change is so hard, and I'm going to share that with you. I think it's important for us to know as therapists. So we systemic therapists look at multi-levels, including the macro level of a socio-cultural uh, context. I'm introducing, or people who write about the neurobiology, the micro level as well, which is what's going on in our cells, in our brains, in our bodies, when we're loving well or very, very stressed. So let's start with the journey of love. <laughs> Researchers um, put crazy in love folks into the fMRI machine, which tracks blood flow to the brain. And they found that the reward centers of the brain were extremely active when people looked at a picture of their beloved. Um, it's the same area of the brain that's activated with cocaine. So those of you who have fallen in love um, may remember what it felt like. Maybe it's even recent. Um, and that is very similar to cocaine. In other words, your reward centers are really bubbling. The critical judgmental parts of the brain go offline in crazy in love. So you don't see your partner's flaws. Um, uh, I uh, fell in love in a castle. Uh, I, my sister fixed my husband and me up. And on our second date, when I met him, I, I, it was in the castle at Brandeis University, which was the student union. And we really fell in love at that moment. And, and um, it's, it was very, very heady time. Um, so love is blind. In early love, the judgmental areas of the brain are quiet. We don't see our lover's flaws. I was enchanted by my, my beloved's messy room in his apartment. He wasn't my neat Nick father. My beloved's mess was so charming. You can guess what we've been fighting about for 54 years, but I'll leave that for later. <laughs> um, Neuroscientists look at the chemicals of, of love, of being crazy in love. One is testosterone, which fuels lust. Um, the next one is oxytocin, which fuels bonding and attachment, both between mothers and babies and fathers and babies and between lovers. Norepinephrine is a focus on that special someone where you have eyes only for your lover. And dopamine, I need you, I want you, I can't get enough. But passionate love doesn't last long. That's sort of the sad part of this story. After about one or two years, we wake from the spell and we see our partner more realistically, warts and all. While my lover wasn't my neat neck father, it turns out I am. So we wake up and we see the things that really bug us and our partner sees those things in us too. That's where the trouble starts. That's also where the challenge to develop long-term love starts. Um, we go sometimes from crazy in love to lazy in love. We take our partner for granted. We get annoyed at, at their foibles and their habits, and we fall into the blame game. We also get distracted, especially by our devices. I think the issue of presence is absolutely crucial in long-term love. That's Gottman's turning toward your partner. And de devices take us away from our partner. So I think the issue of how much are we on our cell phones when we're at dinner at home with our beloved it's a real, and with our children also, if we have children, is a really important issue. Um, passionate love doesn't last very long. It, if, it, if we're lucky and it turns into a good relationship, it yields to, it becomes something called companionate love. This is something that researchers have studied, um, which is a sort of more sedate version, but it's a, it's a version that allows you to really bond. And if you decide to have children, to have children. But many people miss the pizzazz of that early crazy falling in love state. And when they don't feel it anymore, they think something is wrong. So you might've had a client who comes to you and says, you know, I still love my wife, but I've fallen out of love with her, which means I'm not getting that hit of dopamine anymore. And part of our work, I think, is to educate clients on the normal processes of love, including the neurobiology part of it. Research shows that relationship 
satisfaction tends to deteriorate over time. Both passionate and companionate love deteriorate over time, which is rather depressing, except it does allow us to think about how to be more proactive, which I'll get to. I want to um, reference Stephen Mitchell. He was a psychoanalyst in New York City who wrote a beautiful uh, book, which I highly recommend. It's called Can Love Last? The Fate of Romance Over Time. If you haven't heard of Stephen Mitchell, you've certainly heard of Esther Perel, who is a dear friend. Um, and Esther really was very influenced by Stephen Mitchell's work. Both of them look at the tension between passion on the one hand and stability and security in a long-term relationship on the other hand. Um, but Mitchell points out even our assumptions about security are actually a myth. He says, love is a sandcastle built for two, which I find really beautiful. We need to constantly build and rebuild a long-term loving relationship. You can't just kind of rest on your laurels. Um, as Sue Johnson, uh, EFT, says, the bond of love is a living thing. If we don't attend to it, it naturally begins to wither, which I think is a really beautiful statement. I once heard a minister say, if you don't, this is about marriage, which also is a, a, applies to long-term relationships. If you don't get married every day, you get unmarried every day. So that notion of having a certain intention and, and a certain focus on cultivating the relationship with your beloved is, is, is a daily process. It's not something you could just say, okay, now we're married, now I can relax. Um, couple therapy often is focusing on maintaining and cultivating long-term love. Part of the work is psychoeducation about how to do that. So what does it take to be a good lover? <laughs> I think the basic ingredient is the Yiddish term mensch. Uh, to be a mensch is to be a good human being and to reach for your best self. We're going to look at relational ethics, the way of asserting your own voice while making room for your partner's voice, cultivating loving presence as opposed to distraction, being intentional in your loving so that's what we're going to be focusing on as we go. Let's look at cultural beliefs about love. Cultures differ a lot in terms of their expectations about love. So one of the findings is that in long-term love, the relationship satisfaction uh, deteriorates long-term marriage um, or long-term relationships. But that's not all in all cultures. There are cultures, for example, where there's arranged marriages like in India and other traditional cultures, where there isn't such a steep decline in relationship satisfaction over time. <clears throat> and the reason seems to be because people don't have the expectation that you should fall madly in love and keep it going like that all the time. <clears throat> so I think that, that that issue is really important to look at. I think that some, many of the dominant cultural US values are really problematic when it comes to love. <clears throat> one is happily ever after, right? You put all this energy into a wedding or into a celebration, <clears throat> gay or straight, excuse me. <clears throat> and then you're supposed to have happily ever after. Well, that is in fact a myth. In fact, long-term love takes work. The values of individualism, competition, and entitlement, uh, which are dominant U.S. cultural values, I think are quite problematic for long-term love. We focus in the dominant U.S. culture on my rights, less on my relational responsibility. And I think we have to look at both. Also falling in love and falling out of love are really passive descriptions. It's like falling into a pothole. So I like to think about proactive loving. How can we be more proactive in, in, our, in our approach? And we'll look at that in a little while. So there's a paradox at the um, heart of love, which is, that um, on the one hand, we're, <clears throat> we're wired to connect, we're wired to bond, attach. We love being in love. Anybody who's been in love, you know what I'm talking about. But we're also wired to self-protect when we feel threatened. So we're not just um, creatures looking out for ourselves. We don't only go to fight or flight. We also have instincts for attachment, compassion, care, and bonding. And there's a wonderful literature on this. I'll mention two books that are my favorites. One is by Dr. Keltner, a neuropsychologist in, um, at uh, Berkeley, I believe. Yeah, Berkeley. Um, and his book is called Born to be Good, The Science of a Meaningful Life. I highly recommend it. And then Shelley Taylor, who is a, this is a long word, psychoneuroimmunologist. <laughs> okay, psycho is the brain. 
neuro, uh, no, psycho is the mind, uh, neuro is the brain, and immunology is your immune system. So psychoneuroimmunology looks at the interplay between brain and body and health. And she wrote a beautiful book called The Tending Instinct, also showing how we really are, we have, we have instincts for care. However, we also have instincts for fight or flight or freeze or whatever our self-protective mechanism is when we feel threatened. Attachment and trust can be eroded in the couple, especially if old wounds from childhood are triggered. And we're going to be looking into that. So I'm sure many of you know about John Gottman's wonderful research. If you don't, I highly recommend it. He studied happy and unhappy couples over 25 years and looked at the two sides, the two extremes, the what he called the masters and the disasters, the really happy folks and the really unhappy folks. And here's what he found. The happy folks that, who are well partnered over time have a friendship and respect and mutual admiration. They nurture the we. This is a really important issue. Our culture is so much about me or I, me versus you. Without losing the I, Gottman's happy couples nurture the we. They turn toward each other, not away from each other or against each other. That's really important. Against each other is fighting a lot. Turning away is kind of losing the connection, um, be, becoming indifferent or being too busy for each other. And turning toward is really noticing each other, and that will be true on a daily basis. Gottman's happy couples nurture a culture of positivity, a five to one ratio of positive to negative interactions, which even when they're fighting, this part blows my mind, even when you're fighting, you nurture more positive than negative um, interactions. So that's a tall order, but I think one to aim for. His happy couples do fight. They, they're not like all happy all the time. But the conflict is constructive. Um, often, if it, in a heterosexual couple, it's often the wife in a marriage who raises the issues. And the happy couples, the wife does this in a soft way. It's called a soft startup. She's not like boiling when she comes at him. Um, and, the, and the conflict is, is constructive. Um, actually, I just saw uh, in, for, for, for Valentine's Day in the New York Times, um, Julie and John Gottman were quoted, and Julie Gottman said, we fight not to win, we fight to learn about each other, which I thought was just a beautiful way of talking about fighting. Um, and so that's an interesting way to look at it. They're, the happy couples don't get physiologically flooded during conflict. That's really important because when you're physiologically flooded, you can't see straight, you see red, then you're, uh, well, as we'll look at, your amygdala is running the show, your primitive brain, and you really can't do much as productive. So Gottman's happy couples do fight, but they don't get totally overwhelmed. And they repair well and often. Um, Gottman has a wonderful book on trust that where he talks about how trust is actually built through repair. It's not that you either have, you know, trust or you don't have trust, or you have a good relationship or you don't have a good relationship. Even happy couples have these moments of disconnect, but they're able to repair well, which I think is really important. So saying you're sorry is a really important. Remember the old movie? I don't know how, how old you guys are, but I remember the movie Love Means Never Having to Say You're Sorry, the movie Love Story, which I think is really inappropriate. I think that saying you're sorry, and if, you, if, you, if you're blocked on saying you're sorry, that's something to work on in therapy. So let me add some more ideas about distressed couples, the unhappy couples. I made up this term, the five disses of unhappy couples. They are often disconnected, discouraged, <clears throat> disempowered, and we'll talk about power, dysregulated, D-Y-S, regulated, right? They're, they're not regulated. And they're often dissing each other, disrespecting each other. They get caught up often in the blame game. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. Um, with a linear view, right? I'm the victim, you're the perpetrator. Now, I'm, I want to make clear, I'm not talking about abusive or violent couples. That's not my area of specialization. So I, I don't want to suggest that, that it's always circular, but in sort of more run-of-the-mill couples where it's not so extreme, but they do hurt each other emotionally, there's often a sense of, I got hurt and it's your fault. That's a linear view. And um, as Olga Silverstein and many of my early teachers taught me, we need to, I think she said, we induct people into thinking in a circular manner, which I think is really important. 
Um, Gottman's unhappy couples have more negative than positive interactions. They do get flooded during conflict, don't repair well. So it's just the obverse of the happy couples. They focus on me versus you instead of we. And they turn against each other or away from each other instead of toward each other. Um, by the way, I, another caveat, I'm not in this talk suggesting that all couples who come to therapy should stay together. <laughs> we, we don't really know why people are coming to therapy. Some people really are, are, are wanting to make a good divorce or separate well. Some people may be poorly fitted for each other. It's not for me really to judge, but it is for me to tune into what they're looking for and try to help them help guide them in that regard. So let's look at the couple's dance of emotional reactivity. As I said before, each feels like a victim, often disempowered, blaming the other. In psychoanalytic terms, we talk about projection, often dealing with knee-jerk reactivity driven by the emotional brain, which we'll look at. And what we know is that severe relation, relationship stress can negatively affect both physical and mental health. That's really important. We're going to look at uh, the... The main uh, stress hormone is cortisol, and cortisol can really mess up your brain and your body. Um, so it, this is really, it, you know, relationships get under our skin for better or for worse. So let's get into some of the neurobiology here, the neurobiology of couple reactivity. So um, those of you who have heard Dan Siegel speak probably know what I'm about to share with you, but I'm going to go over it anyway. I think it's a, it's a wonderful um, tool for therapy. And for our own understanding, it's called the hand model of the brain. So I'm going to ask you to uh, raise your right hand, fold in your thumb, fold down your fingers. Your uh, fist is your brain. Your arm is your uh, spinal cord with the vagus nerve inside connecting brain to body. The outer skin is your neocortex. That's the latest part of the brain to evolve. I should add our brain evolved from lower creatures. That's really important to understand. Part of our brain is the same brain as more primitive animals. Um, the fingernails are the prefrontal cortex, which actually is located be behind your forehead. Okay, so behind your forehead is your prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that allows you to make good choices and regulate your emotions. The middle two fingernails are the middle prefrontal cortex, which re really regulate your emotions. Now, if you pick up your fingers and you look at your thumb, this is the limbic system, the emotional brain. And right there in the middle is the amygdala, deep in your brain. The amygdala's job is to scan for danger. It's always scanning for danger. Its job is to keep you alive. So if you're walking in a forest and you see a snake, you're out of there before you even know whether it was really a snake or even maybe just a shadow, because that will save your life. If you wait and you cogitate, is it a snake? Is it a shadow? Is it a poisonous snake or a cute snake? You could be dead. So you want to get out of there. That's what the amygdala, amygdala's job is to do. When the amygdala senses danger, it sets off the fight flight response um, or freeze if it's a really life-threatening um, danger uh, and, um, and, 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 you're, and you're reacting right away. Also, this is really important. The amygdala holds the emotional components of old memories, especially from childhood. Um, as William Faulkner, the novelist famously said, the past is never dead. It isn't even past. And Faulkner, I don't think he knew neurobiology, but he was totally right on in terms of this. The amygdala is always holding onto those old memories. And when you get triggered, let's say you had a critical parent and your partner now is critical and you have a meltdown over that in reaction, the likelihood is not just your partner's criticism, it's being triggered by old memories of being criticized as a child. So there's a kind of a double whammy, but usually we're not conscious of this. As Dan Siegel and Hart, his colleague Hartzell wrote, people may become lost in familiar places as they reactivate old patterns of defense. I love that quote, you get lost in familiar place, places. The amygdala is biased towards the negative. It's much better to be safe than sorry. Um, so um, let's say there's that snake or a bear in the woods, or you hear footsteps behind you on a dark street at night and you're, you're, your heart is beating and you quicken your pace. That's all the amygdala getting you into, in that sense, uh, flight. But the amygdala is biased towards the negative. The amygdala also isn't very smart. I don't mean to be disrespectful. We all need the amygdala, <clears throat> but 
the amygdala doesn't differentiate between a scary snake in the forest and a grumpy spouse in your living room. If your spouse is grumpy and let's say, you know, you're fragile that day, or let's say your parents were grumpy in a way that feels like this, you might have a blow up. So um, the nuances of, gee, I wonder, honey, what's wrong? How was your day? You seem kind of stressed. That's a higher level functioning than what the amygdala can bring to us. I sometimes call a couple dances the dance of amygdalas because there is emotional contagion. So if your partner starts, starts getting agitated and you're trying really hard to be calm, but pretty soon you're getting agitated too. And that's because of emotional contagion. Uh, research shows that when we're with someone who's very upset, we often get upset ourselves. So that in a nutshell is the amygdala. One more thing I want to tell you is that when the amygdala, quote, hijacks the brain, this is Dan Goldman's term, when the amygdala hijacks the brain, the prefrontal cortex shuts down, the higher brain shuts down. So now you can't think straight, you see red. Um, and that's not a good time to try to solve problems, by the way. You need, to, you need to find a way to calm down and get back to your higher self. So let's talk about the higher self, the prefrontal cortex. Um, its job, first of all, where is it located? So it's the middle uh, fingernails, the, the middle two fingernails especially. And the, it's one synaptic connection away. It's very close by to the amygdala, Okay. And it, what the prefrontal cortex does is it regulates emotions, it calms the amygdala, it allows for response, flexibility, thoughtfulness, a moral behavior, connecting to your higher values. It's a crucial part of what makes us human and not just animals in, in a lower animal sense, okay? As Dan Siegel says, when you flip your lid, going back to our hand model, your prefrontal cortex goes offline and the amygdala is running the show. This is a lovely neuroeducational technique for your clients because it normalizes their reactivity. We all have, uh, and if you're not a, if you're not a, a therapist, it, for yourself, right? Because I know this is a public lecture. The the amygdala, the, the prefrontal cortex allows us to be our best self. The hand model of the brain really allows us to make those choices, and also it's de shaming because we all have an amygdala. It's not like you're a bad person necessarily if you have a meltdown once in a while. If you're having it all the time, you need to you need to work on that. Obviously, it's not just the brain in your skull. The brain is embodied. We have that that brain body uh, connection all, all the time. And um, uh, there's a constant flow between the brain and body back and forth. Emotions start in the body, in the viscera, in your gut, in your heart. So when you say, "I have butterflies in my stomach." My heart is my heart is beating so fast because I'm so excited. Or I have butterflies in my stomach. That's actually literally accurate. That's actually where the where the uh, emotions start. The information travels up the vagus nerve into the brain. Eventually, it comes to the frontal part of the brain where you name it. The ability to read your body cues is called interoception. It's that big long word right here. Interoception. So perception is seeing outward. Intero means inward. So interoception is perception of what's going on inside your body. It's very important for regulating your emotions to know what you're feeling. It's very important for empathy to be able to read your partner's feelings as well. And to do that, to read your own, your own experience of what's going on. There is a term called alexithymia. It's a Greek term, which means the inability, A, Lexi, to read thymia, your emotions. It's actually a neurological condition, but depending on how you're raised and depending on your gender, you may end up with alexithymia because if you're taught not to tune into vulnerable emotions, as many men in our culture are, then you may not know emotions other than anger, for example. Um, the, the term normative male alexithymia has been used to describe this. And one of the things I think we need to think about is how are we raising our boys as well as our girls, as well as gender fluid kids uh, to tune in and be in emotionally intelligent about their, their experience. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the hormones of stress and connection. As I mentioned, cortisol is the main stress hormone. Um, Long-term high levels of cortisol, let's say you're living in poverty, 
gun violence, uh, war, all the things that are going on in our world now, or a toxic home environment, um, can actually affect negatively affect your brain. They can affect your ability to learn. Because deep in your brain near the um, amygdala is the hippocampus, which is where we learn stuff. And the hippocampus has a lot of cortisol receptors. So if there's a lot of stress and a lot of cortisol, it's going to attach to that those hippocampus receptors and block some of the functioning or impair some of the functioning of the hippocampus. Cortisol, long-term cortisol also affects the immune system and other body functions and health. That's pretty negative actually. But we have an innate, uh, in kind of within us, we have a, a lovely antidote to cortisol and that's called oxytocin. If any of you have given birth, you may, you, you have experienced oxytocin. Um, oxytocin facilitates birth. It facilitates nursing. It's released with orgasm, you know, the rosy glow after you make love. That's oxytocin bonding you to the person you've just made love with, which leads one neuroscientist to say, be careful who you sleep with because you may fall in love with them, whether or not it's really where you want to be. Um, but oxytocin bonds lovers. It bonds mothers and babies, as I said. And it's also released with gentle touch, massage, and, um, and a good conversation with a friend with empathy. So unhappy couples have a lot of cortisol and not a lot of oxytocin. Happy couples have less cortisol, more oxytocin. We want to try to help the couple ship that balance. And there are many ways, to, of course, to do that. Let's look at automaticity versus choice. We live most of our life on automatic pilot driven by our lower brain. We are creatures of habit. Um, and we have survival strategies that, that protect us. Um, but we also have choice, which is a prefrontal process. Okay, so we're very much creatures of habit, but we also have choice. Uh, some people call that free will. I don't know if it's totally free, but we certainly have the capacity to make choices. As Viktor Frankl, who wrote uh, after the concentration camps that he experienced, famously said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our freedom to choose which I really love. Um, I think that, that we're not just, you know, behavioral uh, creatures who get stimulated and we have a response and there's nothing inside our head going on. There's a lot going on. And inside that, we can cultivate our power to choose. A great deal of our work as therapists is to facilitate choice in couples therapy and to help clients' prefrontal cortex come back online. I sometimes think about the fork in the road, like the picture in this, in this slide. I will help, and I'll give you an example when I come to a clinical example in a minute. But you know, your 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 you know your your automatic response of defensiveness or blame or reactivity with your partner, and what we do in therapy is we help clients think through what it what what would they like to do the next time that moment happens, the next time their partner is critical, critical instead of running away or getting mad. What else might they do? They might, for example, pause and say, I see you're really overwhelmed. Let's talk about what you need right now. So that fork in the road is a really important, empowering, empowering technique. Um, I just want to say before we go on um, that if people have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, and Marlene is going to monitor the Q&A. And at some point in a little while, I'll probably see if there's any questions that have come up. So feel free to ask questions. I know I'm sharing a lot with you, and some of this may be new for some folks. It may be familiar for, for others. One of the main issues in unhappy couples and unhappy, frankly, individuals and families is a sense of emotion dysregulation when you're all agitated. And um, Dan Siegel talks about self-soothing as parenting yourself from the inside out. One of Dan's best books is called, early books is called Parenting from the Inside Out. It's a parenting guide, but it also brings in the neuroscience, co-authored with Mary Harsell, a parenting educator. And this quote comes from that. In other words, if you can self-soothe, then you're going to be less vulnerable to what your partner is dishing out or random people on the street who are annoying you, et cetera. There's been a lot of research on emotion regulation techniques, what works, what doesn't. And I want to share some of those with you. 
there's several different categories of emotion regulation. One is top-down cognitive from the prefrontal cortex. One is to simply name your emotion. <clears throat> and Dan Siegel calls this name it to tame it. So if you're if you're all agitated and you say to your partner, you know, I'm really upset right now. You know, can we talk? I'm I'm feeling uh, you know, angry and I don't know how to put words to it. Just naming that can actually calm you down because when you name anything, including an emotion, your left prefrontal cortex, which is the narrating part of your brain, is activated. So let's say your amygdala is all agitated and you're all upset and you say, I'm really upset right now. Just saying that, assuming you're not screaming, right? <laughs> you're not like, shooting with all your 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 energy uh, with at your partner but you're 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 speaking it you're narrating your experience that can actually calm you down uh, another well researched to, uh, top down cognitive emotion regulation technique is reappraisal what we therapists call reframing right so you come down to breakfast and let's say your partner is a scholar as mine is and you see you know papers on the kitchen table and your instinct is to say, oh, they're so selfish. They didn't think about me when they when they left their papers all over the table. And the reframe might be, my beloved is a scholar who's in the middle of a project and forgot to put the stuff away so I can gently move it away so I have space at the table for myself. That will totally change you know, how, how you look at that. Or let's say your partner who normally cleans up after themselves leaves a bunch of dishes in the sink and runs off to work. And you come down later because you're a later sleeper and you see all these dishes in the sink. So one option is what a selfish so-and-so. They didn't even clean up after themselves, right? That's going to lead to a certain behavior. The reframe or the reappraisal is, you know, she doesn't normally leave her stuff in the sink. I think, I know she's very stressed out about her meeting at work today. And I know she's also taking the kids to school. So I'm happy to clean up for her today. So that's reappraisal. Another top-down cognitive emotion technique, regulation technique, is exploring your own values and operationalizing them. What matters to you? What kind of person do you want to be in this relationship? We'll come back to that a little later. So those are top-down cognitive techniques, which, which activate the prefrontal cortex and calm down that amygdala. Very important. I like to talk about bringing prefrontal thoughtfulness to amygdala reactivity. You take our deep breath. Now we're going to get into the breath. Okay, bottom-up body-based emotion regulation techniques. One is just breathing. I mean, probably most of you have been exposed to meditation and breathing practices. Um, belly breathing, especially a, the long, slow exhale, calms you down because it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is the amygdala and all that jazzy reactivity. The parasympathetic nervous system is the calming, soothing nervous system. And belly, the long exhale in the belly breath activates your parasympathetic nervous system. So there are many different breathing techniques to use. These are often incorporated into mindfulness meditation, which many people are doing these days. And have been found, and that's been found to be extremely helpful with emotion regulation and just in general for general health and well-being. Finally, if you just put a hand on your heart. You know, you're 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 starting to get upset, and you just put a hand on your heart, and you feel the warmth of your own hand. That can also calm you down. So there are many body techniques, also as well as cognitive techniques. Sometimes, if a client is very upset and their amygdala is all jazzed up, I might ask them to Im imagine their amygdala, like maybe a little child having a temper tantrum, and then I ask them to imagine their prefrontal cortex coming in like a good parent to calm down the amygdala, to be hang out with the amygdala, to calm them down. And clients love this because it's empowering. It externalizes the whole scenario, and it also normalizes. We all have an amygdala. We all have a prefrontal cortex. And then finally, for those of you who know Dick Schwartz's internal family systems work, IFS, you can do the same thing in, in a kind of IFS parts work. I won't go into that now. And finally, it's not just soothing yourself. It's also soothing each other. So there's a really interesting um, body of research on the interpersonal regulation of emotion. So they they put a, a, a woman in a, um, a heterosexual woman who was well married, well, a heterosexual woman in an fMRI machine and she was gonna get an electric shock. And there were three conditions. One was she was holding nobody's hand while she was waiting. Second, she was holding 
a stranger's hand. And the third is she was holding her partner's hand and it was a good relationship. And what they found is that her reactivity to the anticipation of the shock and her reaction to the shock itself was much less, much more calm when she held her partner's hand and they had a good relationship. This is um, Cohen's voice, Cohen, C-O-A-N. And then of course, there was a follow-up to that study between Cohen and Sue Johnson, and they who's the emotionally focused therapy uh, person. And they did the same study, but one ver the first version was a couple where they had a problematic relationship, their attachment wasn't so good. Um, and she did not get the boost from holding a partner's hand when they were emotionally disconnected in their relationship. Then they, the same couple went through a course of emotionally focused therapy. I think it was eight sessions where they really focused on the emotional connection and attunement. They got to a place of secure attachment, repeated the experiment, and she got the boost from holding his hand. So that's a beautiful example of bringing the neuroscience together with, with the therapy technique. Uh, and so that issue of soothing each other, I think, is really important. Without bothering with the, with the fMRI machine, you could do this by hugging uh, sex, gentle touch, empathy, laughter, massage, all of which, again, increase oxytocin and decrease cortisol. So I think that there's a balance. You don't want to only look to your partner for emotion regulation because that puts too much of a burden on your partner. But you also don't want to only regulate yourself and never turn to your partner. So in a good relationship, there's a kind of flow uh, between the two. Um, Marlene, uh, uh, maybe I can pause and see if there's any questions at this point. Um, yes, there are some questions. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Uh, the first question is, can you discuss libido discrepancy and how to help clients or yourself manage that when recognizing the lust honeymoon stage doesn't last? Um, so I, I'm not an expert in that, but I will say this, that we know that libido and, and, and testosterone levels vary a lot among people. Um, men generally have more testosterone than women. So if it's a heterosexual relationship, not always, but sometimes, and maybe often, it's the male partner who has a greater libido because of the testosterone. But um, there, there's an interesting study in, in, in the Philippines of, um, of a couple who have a child. And before they have the, ch the child, before they're even partnered, the guy who has the high libido and the high testosterone, you know, gets gets the girl. That's that culture, okay? Um, and that's great. Then he gets partnered, and then they have a baby. And when he takes care of his baby and he becomes a really good father, his testosterone levels fall. Now, some people may be dismayed to hear that. They don't want their testosterone levels to fall. But if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view and from a family dynamics point of view, it's really important that a father and a mother take care of their baby without a lot of aggression. And testosterone is often associated with aggression. So um, the lowering of the testosterone is nature's way of adjusting to the task at hand, right? So he, he's got a lot of testosterone and he attracts, you know, whether it's a guy or a gal, but, but when it comes to raising a child, he needs less testosterone. So I, I think that there's that, and there's also just natural differences. I think in general, working around those differences respectfully is really all we can do. And of course we look at, are there, is there a history of trauma or sexual abuse that might be fueling somebody's hesitation around getting together sexually? But I think there is, there really is a lot of variation. And I think we need, like everything else, we need to honor the differences. Okay. The next question is, can you discuss how to help couples address criticism and or depression when the depressed person is placing too much need on their partner, but not willing to go to individual therapy. Right. So first of all, if it's a couple issue, I would certainly encourage them to go to couple therapy. And I've had the experience where one partner, often in a heterosexual couple, the wife will go to therapy and say, my husband refuses to go, but we have some serious issues. In which case, or it could be that he's depressed and he doesn't want to be in therapy at all. In which case, I get a message to him, either directly or through her, that she's there to work on the relationship. She's coming to see me to work on the relationship. And if I were him, I wouldn't want to be totally at the mercy of her work with me to determine what their relationship will look like. 
if I were him, I want to have a say in what the, the relationship is going to look like, which is really an invitation to power, not power over, but power to co-determine the relationship. And based on that, I never had a man refuse to come based on that. Now, people are understandably afraid of therapy. You know, I go to therapy and I'm going to get, you know, a wacko diagnosis or, you know, only crazy people go to therapy or my mother went to therapy and then she ended up in a mental institution. I don't know what the background is, what the fear is, but I think um, I view therapy, individual and couple, as a, a chance for empowerment, to understand yourself better and to get to get tools. I also use the term tools for your toolbox, which a lot of people who are hesitant to therapy really like because it, it gives them a very concrete sense that they're going to come out of therapy, not just with a lot of emotions and a lot of you know, amorphous blame or whatever, but they're going to come out with concrete tools. So I think that would be my, my suggestion. Uh, there's a clarification on that question okay. uh, where uh, the person wants to clarify if that uh, they are in couples therapy, but he needs individual. Okay. And he's resisting that is basically what's going on. Yes. Right. Well, look, I, I feel like this is a little bit like um, a person who's drinking too much and the partner says, you know, you need to stop drinking or go to AA, you know, you have an alcohol problem. And he says, I don't have an alcohol problem. Well, it turns out your partner has a problem with what your relationship with alcohol is. And does that matter to you? I think the same would be true about depression. I can understand people being hesitant for multiple reasons. But instead of saying go to therapy for your depression, I would say, you know, are you willing to consult someone? for an assessment. And then it's your decision whether you go to therapy or take medicine or whatever. There's many different approaches to the treatment of depression. Uh, but I would also wanna find out why that person who is at this point my client in couple therapy, I believe, why they're hesitant to, to, to go to couple therapy. It may be that they're feeling that their partner is blaming them. I don't know, and I don't wanna go into more of the case, but there are many reasons why. And I think we, we need to work carefully and thoughtfully in a collaborative way to help people make better choices. Okay. This next question is, can you discuss how to help those with alexithymia express empathy to their partner? Yeah, so um, I've actually worked with people who don't have much um, interoception. And I help them identify um, what's going on in their body that they don't necessarily understand or think about. So for example, people with temper tantrums go from zero to 100 very fast. And I help them slow down and think about kind of the cues in their body before they blow. Because once you blow, you're, you're like, your amygdala is running the show and your prefrontal cortex is offline. It's a little late in the game then. But if you start feeling your heart race a little bit before you blow or your teeth clenching, people identify what is going on in their body. Then I think, um, I think then they can slowly back up to before they blow to identify their body cue. So a lot of understanding the other person means also reading your own body. So self-empathy, I think, is crucial for that as well. There's a lot of techniques that therapists use. There's the speaker-listener technique for empathy, yeah. which is a, one speaks and the other listens, not to rebut, but to summarize what the other one said um, with eye contact, which is really important. Uh, there's there's many other techniques for, for empathy training. And um, uh, I again, I view that as tools for your toolbox. And many people who, many men who are socialized against the softer emotions are at a disadvantage and, and need to get you know a little bit of help with that. But also people who were raised in homes where they were not, where parents didn't help them name their emotions, I think need help. So I think that that's something that a lot of this is about education, psychoeducation. Maybe one more question if there is one and then we can go on. Okay, how do you reappraise behaviors that are repetitive? Well, most behaviors are repetitive if they're ingrained. So I think there's, there's, the, there's the behavior, the reappraisal is actually cognitive, right? So um, we look at the cognition, we look at the behavior, uh, we look at the emotional experience, they're all factors in this. But I would say that um, understanding, uh, you know, the, and I'm not sure if the question is about one's own behavior or the partner's behavior, but let's say it's the partner's behavior, being curious and the therapist's job would be to help this happen in therapy. What's going on at that moment when they do this, whatever the behavior is, is that's objectionable. My guess is it's probably self-protective. We're going to get into that actually in, in the next. Maybe I'll go on from here and we'll talk about the vulnerability cycle. Okay? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Oops. The couple vulnerability cycle. So Michelle Schenkman, uh, as I mentioned, who's speaking next in this series, and I spent two years going over preparing this article for publication called The Vulnerability Cycle, Working with Impasses in Couple Therapy. And what we do is we identify the couple's dance. Um, the, for example, pursue distance or criticize, defend. Partners often, as I said, have a linear view. You know, you're 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 not around, so I have to chase you. Um, or you're always on my case, so I have to run away. And we help them look at how it's a circle. The more one pursues, the more the other distances. And we challenge the blame game. Um, when couples are caught up in a blame game in my office, I will often say to them, you know, maybe don't take the blame home today when you finish the session. Maybe hold, I'll hold on to it for you for the next session. I'll watch it for you. And they laugh because basically, this is called externalizing the blame, right? Blame is now a thing that they can choose to take home or choose to leave with me. And I encourage them to, to, to leave it with me. Or if we're in the middle of a session, I might say, you know, I feel like there's a lot of blame going on right now. Let's do an experiment. Let's put the blame like outside the door of our therapy room and see how this conversation goes without that blame. And then of course, it's a very different conversation. So I think that's really important. We identify each person's vulnerabilities and survival strategies fueling the dance and how each one's survival strategy triggers the other's vulnerability in a recursive cycle. I'm gonna show you in a minute an example of this. I call it, and Michelle and I call it survival strategies, not defense mechanisms, which is what more of the psychoanalytic language is. For me, defense mechanism has a more negative connotation. Like people shouldn't be so defensive. Survival strategies connotes a really deep respect for how people learned how to literally survive in their home growing up. If you scratch the surface of how people got these quote defense mechanisms, what you're learning is that they developed the best way possible to survive and thrive in their family of origin. So I have deep respect for my clients' survival strategies, even as I'm challenging them. That's really, really important to, to hold both the, this, the respect and the, and the support and also the challenging. Partners bring these same strategies to their relationship as adults, but now instead of helping them survive, they're getting in the way and they're alienating and hurtful to the partner. Um, a man who learned to survive, as we'll see in a moment, by withdrawing as a kid to avoid family dynamics and intensity, now does that with his wife when she's upset or critical. She then gets angry and comes at him with more intense pursuit and anger, and they become trapped in their vicious cycle. Much of my work involves helping clients understand and grow up their survival strategies, which I'll talk about, so they're more adaptive and productive in the current relationship. Um, I want to help, and again, I'll come back to this, help clients get meta. It's a term I made up. Meta is above. That's the Greek word for above. To get meta to the cycle, and we're going to look at the cycle in a minute, um, to become curious about it, to externalize the dance. That's a term from Michael White, narrative therapy. Um, to see, this is the cycle we have co-created. This is co-responsibility instead of blaming each other to move from being a victim to being the author of your own response and co-authors of the relationship. This process is very empowering. So now I'm going to show you a case, an example. This is a hypothetical case, composite case. It's not real folks, because I wouldn't put them on the screen like this, but um, it's based on real experiences in my practice and my life. So um, it's Carla and Len, they are a middle-aged, heterosexual, or or it's called uh, opposite sex, uh, Caucasian couple, uh, white couple, married uh, 25 years with two sons who are now, uh, one is launched, one is at home in high school. Len is an attorney in a high-powered law firm. He prizes rationality and order. He needs calm. He craves calm when he comes home from work. Carla is a poet and a stay-at-home mother. She tends to be disorganized. While their older son in college is a star achiever and, and, and colored inside the lines, the younger son, Matt, who's a freshman in high school, has always been more vulnerable and challenging. Like his mother, Matt is disorganized and distractible. He's recently been diagnosed with ADHD. 
Carla probably has ADHD too, although not diagnosed. When Len comes home from work and finds chaos at home, his son's coat on the floor and Matt and Carla in the middle of a fight, <clears throat> he gets reactive and blames his wife. Carla feels alone, overburdened, unsupported, and unappreciated. These are her vulnerabilities. By the way, in the cycle, the V over here stands for vulnerabilities. The SS stands for survival strategies, and we'll come and look at how they interact with each other. So she, her vulnerabilities are feeling unsupported, unappreciated, and criticized. Um, for uh, and and, uh, uh, and for, by Lynn for all she's trying to do to keep Matt focused on his school, which she's really trying. She gets defensive and angry, which are her survival strategies. So she's creative, but that's the survival strategy that's not a problem in this relationship. Everybody likes her creativity. But her defensiveness and anger when she feels criticized by Len is part of the cycle that's very problematic. Uh, for his part, Len feels frightened and overwhelmed, his vulnerabilities. That's B over here, his vulnerabilities. Um, by the emotional intensity and chaos when he walks in the door. He reacts with criticism and withdraws. Now, like Carla, he has survival strategies that are not problematic in the relationship. He's hardworking and rational, which works well for a lawyer. But in their dance, when she is, he gets critical and distant, right? And she gets defensive and angry. And that is problematic between the two of them. Uh, his criticism and withdrawal makes Carla feel more alone and unprotected, which fuels her anger, which in turn fuels Lynn's anxiety, which makes him withdraw more. Each blames the other in a linear fashion, but their dance is circular as each one's survival strategy activates the other's vulnerability. So you see, that's that's the dance. And this is what Michelle and I worked so hard to create. It's the intrapsychic process, right? She has these vulnerabilities and survival strategies, and so does he. And it's the interaction because when she feels vulnerable, her survival strategy of defensiveness and anger get triggered, which hit him in his vulnerability of feeling overwhelmed and frightened, which triggers his survival strategy of being critical and distant, which makes her more feeling unappreciated, unsupported, and alone, which makes her more defensive and angry, which makes him more overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera. That's the dance, okay? In the beginning of this couple's relationship, trust and intimacy were high. Len adored Carla's free spirit and creativity. Carla cherished Len's solidity and clear thinking. So the very things that are driving them crazy now are what attracted them in the beginning. And I find that that's very, very common with couples. Now, after years of enacting their unhappy dance, trust and intimacy have eroded, and each resents the very qualities in the other that fueled their early love. His orderly rationality and her free-spirited poetic soul once complemented each other. They fit well together. Now they're polarizing the couple, fueling a mutually resentful vulnerability cycle. Carla is a dreamer and a poet. She can get a bit flaky and messy. She's been a good mother, but has found parenting met a huge challenge. He is like her in many ways. Keeping him on track with his schoolwork is a full-time job at times, and Carla often feels like she's failing at that job. Len is very rational and devoted to his work at which he excels. He's a lawyer. He yearns to come home to a neat home and dinner bubbling on the stove and his wife happy to meet him and the kids taken care of, you know, the classic, um, classic patriarchal story. Instead, he comes home to chaos which sets up intense discomfort and alarm bells for him. We're gonna to get to that in a minute. He gets irritated and critical with Carla over the chaos and they fight as soon as he walks into the door and she sees his disapproval and hears his disapproving words. She gets angry when he criticizes the chaos instead of appreciating all she's done for Matt and for the family. She feels alone and unsupported. He feels overwhelmed and appreciated for all he does to support the family. So they're in a very unhappy dance. Let's look at their history. They met in college. He was very studious, the top of his class. She was an art major and squeaked through her more academic subjects. He was attracted to her sense of humor and her joie de vivre, so different from his plodding, solid personality. She was attracted to his solidity and the way she felt protected by him. They adored each other. She admired his fine mind. He admired her poetry and creative insights. 
both loved being loved and both loved being in love. And they were good lovers in the beginning. When Len was in law school and Carla a fine arts master's program in creative writing, they shared what they learned with each other at the end of the day. Each grew in the relationship. Their sex life was passionate and intense. Carla was more sexually experienced than Len and enjoyed teaching Len about love. He looked up to her as his creative and romantic muse. They married and their first son, Robert, was born soon after. He was an easy child who followed the rules and excelled in school like his father and also had some of his mother's sense of humor and spunky spirit. Carla was the primary caretaker parent and she didn't resent it, but felt fulfilled and successful as both a mother and a newly published poet. Matt was born four years after his brother and was a more difficult child. He was a fussy baby. That's actually a thing. It's actually a term for babies who are difficult to soothe and it makes mothers and fathers often feel very incompetent. He was feisty and fussy from birth difficult to soothe, but soothe <clears throat> which made Carla feel insecure and exhausted. She turned to Len for support and relief from baby care when he came home from work, but Len was himself exhausted from work as a junior employee at his law firm, and he had no clue how to parent Matt, so different from compliant Robert. Matt made Len feel incompetent and represented the chaos and wildness that Len had spent his adult life avoiding in himself. Now the plot thickens. Because I'm always interested in what's the family of origin history that fuels these vulnerabilities and survival strategies. Len was an only child, very close with his mother, who saw him as her shining star. She was especially proud of his academic achievements. Len's father, a professor of art history, had a quote, nervous breakdown, unquote, whatever that means. That means, you know, you kind of lose it emotionally. When Len was 13, he became very depressed and unable to work for a year and would periodically erupt in frightening rages. He was later diagnosed as bipolar. When Len sees his son Matt functioning poorly at school or erupting in anger, he becomes reactive. Once again, he's faced with emotion dysregulation, like when he was growing up, and he has no clue how to help. He fears, his, um, he fears that his father's bipolar disorder is genetic, which of course it could be, partly, and that Matt may be bipolar. That terrifies him. When Len was a teenager, he had no idea how to help his father, so he withdrew to his room and to his studies, hoping his mother would somehow figure out how to set his messed up father straight. So you see his vulnerability, his survival strategy of withdrawal comes from his childhood. It was very self-protective. Now, Len hopes Carla will set their son, their son Matt straight, like his mother, he hoped, would set his father straight. Of course, neither worked. Um, when Carla implores Len to, quote, step up to the plate and become more involved with Matt, Len freezes. He has no clue how to help. And he feels like a deer caught in headlights or like a young boy with a father who is falling apart. Carla wants to get Matt assessed by a psychiatrist. Len is terrified that bipolar disorder will be diagnosed and persists in his position that more discipline will fix Matt's problems. Carla was a wild poetic spirit from birth. She was the oldest of four, often delegated by her mother to help care for her younger siblings and help with household chores since both parents worked full time to make ends meet. Carla was responsible and did as her mother requested, but she often would, would, would daydream and not follow through exactly on her mother's list of chores. When her mother came home and saw a mess in the house after Carla had been entertaining her younger siblings for two hours, she would let loose with criticism rather than appreciation for all her daughter had done. Carla was both afraid and resentful of her mother's angry, critical tirades. She felt disconfirmed, unappreciated, and unprotected by her mother. She had a distant relationship with her father, who was absorbed in his work and dealt with his children at a distance. Now when Len comes home and is critical of the mess he finds and doesn't support Carla when she's overwhelmed with Matt, she feels once again unappreciated, and unsupported by Len as she did with her mother as a child. She's also reactive to what she perceives as Len's distance with her, with Matt and with her, which stirs up her feelings about her own father's distance with her. Carla gets angry at Len's criticalness and hands off stance in the family. Her anger further dysregulates Len. So that is their story. Um, we'll, we'll come in, uh, a little bit more into the family of origin now. Um, so I want to, uh, let me just ask, are there any questions in the Q&A that would seem relevant to this, uh, the, the vulnerability cycle? Uh, let's see here.
Um, not sure. Um, uh, a couple I work with has more of a lack in connection and distance as opposed to anger and hostility. How can I help them develop the tendency to look toward each other? So I think that could be related in terms of not blaming. Well, I, look, I, I think that whatever the survival strategies are, and you can have two distancers, right? Um, I'm not here to give clinical advice, but but certainly you can have two people who are both distancers as a survival strategy. And then you do the same thing. You want to understand where did it come from, which I'm going to get to now. I think Let me go into the next slide because I think that really that really relates to this. Family of origin factors fueling the cycle. So old wounds from childhood are often activated in the dance, as I've said before, intensifying the painful emotions with the partner. For example, the partner is critical, which evokes the experience of a critical parent growing up, which is how Carla feels with Lynn. Or the partner is disorganized and emotionally labile, kind of all over the place, evoking the experience of an emotionally labile parent, which is how Lynn feels with Carla. This association is often unconscious. People are often not aware that it's the same feeling they had as a kid, but it fuels current reactivity with the partner. And here's another quote from Dan Siegel, which I really like. When unresolved issues are writing our life story, so we haven't worked through our issues with our family of origin. When that happens, we are not our own autobiographers. We're merely recorders of how the past continues, often without our awareness, to intrude upon our present experience and shape our future direction. I just love that idea because it, it's got empowerment kind of right in the middle there. In other words, if you're just going on automatic pilot from your past, you're really not able to choose your own life. You're really just going on automatic pilot from the past. So I, I think that's a really important quote. So I made up this term called the magic question and I wanna tell you what that is. And that's how we go from the dance or the stuckness with the couple to the family of origin. Basically, I ask a client who's describing a, a very painful situation with their partner now, I say something like, is this feeling familiar to you that you're having with your partner? Have you experienced this in the past, maybe as a child? So I'll give you the example of Len and Carla. When Len comes home and sees mess and emotional chaos, he's triggered by memories of his bipolar father's emotional rages. So when I ask Len, is it familiar to you that you walk into the house and, and you feel totally overwhelmed by emotional chaos. And Len starts to share with Carla, which he's never really shared much with her, about his experience of having a father who had rages, emotional rages, and was all over the place. He didn't know then that he was bipolar. For Carla and for Len also, this is an eye-opening connection. That's why I call it the magic question, because it often opens doors to a much deeper conversation not just about, you know, pursue distance or whatever, but it's about, or criticism, defend, but it's about the, the experience of the person in this moment and how that is an experience they might've had when they were younger. That's Len's ma um, magic question. And that really shifts the conversation for the couple. I asked Carla, when Len comes home and is critical of you for the mess <clears throat> and for how you're taking care of Matt, is it familiar to you from, some experiences you might've had as a child. And she talks about how she experienced what I told you before, how she experienced herself as delegated by her mother to take care of all her siblings. And um, which is what's called a parentified child, a child who has too much responsibility and expected to take care of her younger siblings. And then mother would come home and criticize her for not doing it perfectly and not washing all the dishes in the sink. Um, and Carla also talks about her father's remoteness and how Len's withdrawal triggers her feelings of abandonment. So the response to the magic question is really powerful as each one explores the roots of their reactivity from their childhood. And partners often feel empathic as they witness their partner as a young child. Um, it, it shifts the whole conversation, right? I mean, I'm talking about partners who still love each other. I'm not talking about people who are total enemies and just intent on destroying each other. But people who care for each other, when they see the tenderness of early childhood wounds, are often uh, are often able to extend a lot of compassion and, and empathy, which is really important. Um, couple therapy often involves 
addressing these intergenerational wounds, not just um, identifying the connection for the couple, but also looking at what may be unfinished business with the family of origin. Working through unfinished business from the past, reconsidering old constraining stories about parents and addressing current relationships with the family of origin. Um, I, th I think that's a really important issue, which maybe we'll have time to get back to. Carrying grudges and resentments from the past may negatively affect current relationships with your partner or child. Carrying a chip on your shoulder makes you stoop. <laughs> You're schlepping this baggage, right? This, this heavy, heavy baggage. Um, and partners may seek to, quote, collect damages from their, but, but at the wrong address. They're collecting damages from their partner. So Len expects Carla to keep a person, a perfect, neat home, an emotionally contained home, which is an impossible task with their ADHD son, who's not yet gotten treatment, right? So that puts tremendous pressure on her, which is just how she felt as a kid. Carla is collecting damages. It, this is all inadvertent. This is not on purpose. Carla looks to Lynn to never criticize her, to never make her feel badly about her mothering, which of course is impossible also. So we work to help them both heal old family of origin wounds and to grow up their view of their uh, and their relationships with their family of origin, which hopefully we can look at a little bit more later. So I wanna look at proactive loving, which I mentioned before. Um, um, passive loving, as I said, is falling in love, falling out of love, waiting for your partner to get it right. Proactive loving is what kind of partner do I wanna be? Who do I wanna be in this relationship? Um, and um, it, it's about choice. It's about, I can choose who I wanna be at this moment. Being intentional in our actions with our partner, what are our goals, our values, cultivating presence. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh has a beautiful um, idea about selective watering, which I wanna share with you. So Thich Nhat Hanh is a wonderful um, Buddhist Vietnamese monk who's written many books. Many of us love his books. And he has this idea of selective watering. He says, we all have inside ourselves the seeds of love and compassion. And we also have inside ourselves the seeds of anger and resentment. And the seeds that we water are the ones that will grow. So he says, water your seeds of love and compassion with your partner or your kids or in general not your, your seeds of anger and resentment. It's a beautiful idea. And then he says, and you know, water your own seeds of love and compassion and water your partner's seeds of love and compassion, not their seeds of anger and resentment. So he gives this lecture at, his, at Plum Village in France. That's the village where he gives his lectures. And there's a couple in the front row who often come to his lectures who really adore him. And after the lecture, he comes down and says hello to them. And and as he's talking to them, the wife is crying. Actually, she was crying as he talked about selective watering of your partner. And he said to the husband, your flower needs watering. By which the husband understood that he had been watering his wife's seeds of anger and resentment, not love and compassion. And the story goes that this man left that interaction a changed man. And even his children noticed how much more loving and compassionate he was. So I think that's the shortest um, couple therapy intervention on record. It helped that they had such a positive um, uh, transference towards him. They really, really revered him. So they were ready to hear what he had to say. But I think it's a really important issue. It's a very simple idea, but I think a really important one. We do have some say over what we water. Let's look at habits and change. This is one of the most important things I've learned from neuroscience. On the one hand, we're creatures of habit. We're wired for habit. Uh, these are our survival strategies from childhood. Habits are um, supported by circuits of neurons. So a neuron is a single brain cell and um, it connects to other neurons. Um, and there are millions of neurons in the human brain, each connecting with thousands up to 10,000 other neurons through the synapses, the space between the, the, the uh, neurons, creating trillions of synaptic connections. That's basically what makes us who we are, these synaptic connections, these circuits. The stronger the circuit of neurons is, the stronger our habits are. And the more we repeat a habit, the stronger the circuit of neuron becomes. Um, so the more you do something, the more you will do something in the future. So think about what you do, <laughs> because what you do changes your brain. 
Everything you do changes your brain. And the more you do, somebody uh, asked a question before about uh, repetitive habits, right? Repetitive behaviors. That's exactly what this is about. That the more you do something, the more you will do it in the future. And then you become trapped in your own, uh, in your own habits. Um, I remember at one point I had a, um, a, 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 one night we had had a nice dinner, but I was still a little bit hungry afterwards. And we sat down to watch the news after dinner. And I got myself a little mixture of nuts and raisins. And I watched the news. Uh, it was a little less traumatic than it is these days, but I, I had my little nuts and my nut mixture and I watched. Okay. Next day, uh, I wasn't that hungry. Uh, I had had a bigger dinner, but I went for the nuts, the nut mixture anyway, because now my brain is associating TV news at night after dinner with the nut mixture. The next day, the third night, I, we had had a huge dinner, a late dinner. I was totally stuffed. I, and I start, start salivating from my nuts. And I'm like, I'm like Pavlov's dog. I've trained myself to associate the TV news with my nut mixture. And I did, I went cold turkey on the nuts. <laughs> I decided that if I want to have my nut mixture in the future, I'll have it when I want it during the day when I'm hungry and not automatically because I'm salivating for it because I've trained myself to, to for that habit. So that question of what our habits are is really important. Our survival strategies are habits from childhood. Um, the couple's dance becomes habitual, wired into the brain, and they go on automatic pilot. But we're also creatures of change. We're capable of change or wired for change. The brain has been called an organ of adaptation. Its job is to figure out what will keep us safe. And its job is to both predict the next moment from what we know before, what it knows before, but also to adapt as necessary. And the uh, human brain is very, very adaptive. Um, the key term for this is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change. Um, for all of you who continue to learn as you you know, and continue in your life uh, and uh, who are trying to keep dementia at bay and to uh, be um, peppy in your brains as well as in your bodies throughout life, neuroplasticity is your friend. Um, it continues throughout life. Uh, uh, until about 20 years ago, neuroscientists thought that neuroplasticity was only for young people. Kids, um, young children need neuroplasticity. Young children are born with many more neurons than adults have but many fewer connections, many few circuit, fewer circuits. And um, by age 25, the higher brain, the prefrontal cortex is pretty much connected. The neuronal circuits are connected. It's called wired. Um, and then you, you do start losing neurons as you age. So people thought neuroplasticity isn't really for anybody much past 25. It turns out that's not true. Research shows that neuroplasticity can continue throughout life um, and in a minute, I'll, 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 I'll talk to you about that, about what, what um, it is harder in adulthood. Okay, we talked about the fork in the road. So let me tell you what the secret is to having a neuroplastic brain throughout life, which I think most of us want. Daily physical exercise, crucial for getting blood flow to the brain. Absolutely crucial. Healthy sleep, healthy diet, social connections, paying attention. That's why mindfulness meditation, I think, is so important. And learning new things. All of these are the factors, and there's a lot of research supporting this, that will allow us to have neuroplastic brains. And by the way, drinking a lot of alcohol or getting um, stoned a lot probably is going to diminish neuroplasticity. Um, and uh, I think that's really important. If you have clients who are drinking all the time and trying to change their patterns of behavior, you might want to ask them as a little experiment to cut back on the alcohol for a while to see if their brains can get more, um, be, be more, more um, peppy and more available for them. Um, Mast practice is a term that neuroscientists use to when you want to learn a new habit. So we talked about old habits, old behaviors that are repetitive. Now we want to identify what the new habit might be and then like that fork in the road and then practice it over and over again because you want to get that new habit wired into your brain and, and make that the automatic, the automatic pattern. Um, I want to talk a little bit about resistance in quotes. If you look at most schools of therapy, you're going to see a lot about resistance, whether it's psychodynamic or whether it's family systems or whatever. And often the, the sort of sub, sub, sub vocal implication is, why is this person being so difficult? Why don't they just change the way the therapist is offering this great plan of change? And I feel very different about it. I feel that resistance, quote unquote, is because change is hard in the adult brain. 
just like we saw here with regard to the neuroplasticity. We can do it, but it's much harder than when you're younger. And um, I see resistance. People don't come or they don't do their homework or whatever the issues are. I see it as important feedback for the therapist. This is a collaborative kind of work. And if our clients are, quote, pushing against us, we need to be open to open our hearts and make room for that as, as a communication. Um, and also, once we know the family of origin backstories of clients' vulnerabilities and survival strategies, we can be less judgmental and more compassionate. So I want to share with you the giant exercise, which is an exercise I made up both for clients and also for training purposes. So I'm not going to have you go through the whole exercise now because I don't think we have time, but I want to just share with you the, the basic idea. You can do this privately just very quickly now. Think about a quality of yourself that you'd like to change. It's important. It's something you're really struggling with and have struggled with maybe for a while or someone around you, close to you, really wants you to change in some way. Um, so take a moment to think what that is. <clears throat> and then... Um, now I want you to imagine that a giant comes along and takes away that quality from you all at once not a shred of it is left and how does that feel and I don't know do we have time for people to put a few comments in the chat just a word or two of how does it not about what your quality is that's private but how did it feel for the giant to take away that quality that you would like to change but that's an important quality of you. Maybe people can put a couple of words into the chat and Marlene, you can monitor that. Give people a couple of minutes. Yes, in the meantime, someone would like for you to repeat what masked practice means. Sure. Okay. Masked practice actually comes from stroke research. Masked practice is repeating the new behavior over and over and over again until it becomes wired into the brain, into new neural circuits. So that's really important. And even when the new behavior, let's say you're more kind to your partner or you speak up in, an, in a less angry way or whatever the, the, the thing is that you're trying to, to, to change, when you're tired or stressed from work or sick, you may revert back to the old habits. Those old circuits don't just disappear. <laughs> they can come roaring back again. And so that's another thing I do with clients is I let them know that 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 could happen and not to be too dismayed by that because it's it's a work in progress. And I think that's very reassuring to clients. Uh, one person wrote relief, lightness, but also maybe even vulnerability. Okay. What can I lean on now? Okay, great. Anybody else? I don't see anything else okay. yet. Well, that one person, uh, go ahead. Terrifying, vulnerable. Okay. So those, those are the two poles. Relief, oh, thank God, the giant took it away. I don't have to keep working on this thing, whatever it is. But at the same time, for many people, it's a sense of terror. It's a sense of, well, how do I navigate in the world now if I don't know what I'm doing, right? Um, when I did this exercise for myself, uh, I, I wanted to be less controlling, okay? But when I did the, and the, when the giant took away my control, I felt like, well, how, how am I going to navigate in the world? I, I can't control anything. It was like, it was as if I collapsed being controlling and having a sense of control and some efficacy in my life. And so for many people, the, the nuances and the details, but for many people, the fear is that change could be taking away something that is at the heart of who you are. I want to say that Two things. Number one, the giant exercise gives us information about why clients resist, quote unquote, or hold on to old survival strategies in a very sympathetic way. The other thing is when people go to therapy, many people are afraid, and maybe that's the guy who didn't want to go to therapy for his depression. People are afraid that the therapist is going to be like the giant and take away something dear to them, something that helps them navigate in the world, take away a survival strategy. So understanding the dynamics of the fears of change and the legitimacy around those fears, I think is ab absolutely crucial, really crucial. Let me tell you about Carla and Lynn and the giant exercise we did. So Carla, I asked her what would happen if a giant came along and took away her anger when she feels one is being critical. And she said, I would feel it's all my fault. 
I would have no way to, to see it any other way. And I would just become depressed. So her anger as a kid and her anger with Len is a way to protect herself from taking it all in and blaming herself. I asked Len what would happen if, um, if, you're, if a giant took away your criticism or your withdrawal all at once. And he said, I'd be overwhelmed by emotion and chaos and wouldn't be able to function. So that question is really, really at the heart of the matter. And if you're attuning supportively to clients, you're going to see the, the survival value of what they're doing, even though it's problematic now in the, in the relationship. The goal is to help them refine the survival strategies, right? And become more adept at doing it in a way that doesn't um, hurt the partner so much. But the fear is that they'll, they'll be losing um, what Maurice Friedman called this, the fear of losing your touchstones of reality, the way you navigate in the world, which I think is really beautiful. Were there any other uh, comments in the Q&A or should we, can we, go, should we go on? Um, just loss. Yeah, loss. A absolutely. Grieving. Like, this way has served me. <laughs> Even though it's not good for me and it's not good for my relationship, it's a big loss. Right. Good. So I, I encourage people to play around with, with that idea. I've written about all these ideas. And oh, by the way, I wanted to say I've written a lot of articles as well as my book. And I have a website, monafishbane.com, where I have a list of all my articles and also how to contact me. Um, so if anyone wants to ask me for any of my articles that are listed there, uh, and I think we're also going to send out actually a bibliography after this uh, to people who registered, uh, feel free. I'm ha always happy to share um, what I've written. Okay. Let's look at transforming the vulnerability cycle. I, as I said, I want to help couples get meta to their own vulnerability cycle. I ha I draw the cycle not in the first session. I don't know in the first session. All I know basically is the survival strategies is the, usually the dance, pursue, defend, um, you know, criticize, uh, withdraw, et cetera. Um, but, but the backstory of the vulnerabilities usually comes out a little bit later, maybe several sessions in. And when I feel like it's the right time to do this, I ask the couple if they're willing to draw this with me and we draw the vulnerability cycle together. As they're drawing it, and you, the one you saw of Len and Carla, um, they're drawing it with me. It's not like I'm imposing it on them. And couples find that it's amazing to do this project. Um, some couples actually afterwards put it up on their refrigerator and they say, you know, this is the dance we do together to remind themselves, you know, this is, this is something we do, we both do. Um, and actually, um, uh, you know, they, they laugh because when their kids were younger, they would put their kids' artwork on the refrigerator. This is now their dance. But it allows them to be meta, to be above the dance and to externalize the dance. That's, again, um, uh, Michael White's ideas um, and to take co-responsibility for it. So the blame game is much diminished by drawing this. We're identifying the circular recursive nature of the dance, again, from the linear view to the circular view, both are both victims and inadvertent creators of the vulnerability cycle. Then I help them notice, and this comes back to that body-based work, I help them notice when they're feeling vulnerable and then when their survival strategy is activated. And I encourage them to speak from vulnerability before they get to the survival strategy. So I encourage Len to say, you know, I've had a long, hard day at work and I'm just tried. Um, can we take a little time just to sit together? Or Carla might say, you know, she sees it coming home with a lot of, you know, energy and disappointment. And she says, it's been a really rough time with Matt. Let's, let's all just sit together and, and have, you know, or maybe the two of them would have a drink or whatever they would do. Um, but to speak from vulnerability elicits empathy in the partner rather than attacking them with their, the survival strategy, which activates defensiveness and counterattack. And then I really help clients hold their each other's vulnerability with care. When, when, when partners confide in each other about their vulnerability, it's really very powerful for them to hold with compassion what they know about their partner. And then we help them grow up their, grow up their survival strategies. So I help, um, I help uh, Len think about how he comes into the house at the end of a day. I help him like, instead of, listening to the news on the way home and getting all like wired up about all the terrible stuff going on, which only activates him even more from work. I, I, he decides to listen to classical music and he comes in much more soothed. And then I ask him to think about what intention, what, what intentionality does he want to bring into the house? What, what energy does he want to bring into the house? Knowing especially that Carla is struggling with Matt. 
And he actually has an intentionality for compassion. And that's that's where he goes. That's his fork in the road. For Carla, I, I ask her to think about what it's like for, for, for Len to come home, given what she knows about him. Um, and she, um, she actually starts planning ahead to make sure dinner is ready. She tries to plan ahead so that she and Matt aren't in the middle of, of the worst of the fights over the homework when her husband comes home and then they can figure out other ways of dealing with that. So I think that's really important. Um, I also help the couple slow down the action. We, uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle and I call this freeze frame, right? When it's happening in the in the office, like what, what just happened right now? Can we can we slow down the action and tell me what was going on for each of you in this moment? Because when the amygdala is activated, it's going very fast. The amygdala works way faster than the higher brain. So we're trying to help people just kind of slow down and get curious, like what happened here? And can we make room for both of your experiences? Um, Len learns to take a deep breath and uh, to negotiate a time out if he feels flooded. That's a really important part of his growing up his survival strategy, not to storm off and slam the door, but to say, you know, Carla, I'm really upset right now. And I, I don't want to bring this energy, <clears throat> you know, into our relationship or the house. So I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to meditate and I'll come back out, which she's fine with. Um, and Carla takes a deep breath and holds both her position and Len's position, which is really important. Let's look at power. <laughs> so I wrote an article on facilitating relational empowerment in couple therapy. We usually think of power as power over someone else. I can make you do what I want. And that is a kind of power. It's an important power to understand. It's power over. A lot of this comes from feminist theory and my own version of it. Um, there are power differences in couple. If they're, if they're, um, if they're not gay, then, then there's gender issues uh, between them financial differences, race, class, education, uh, you know, et cetera, who has more money, et cetera. Um, of course, if there's a risk of violence or abuse, that's a huge issue and we have to assess. Um, and power over often shows up as competition, domination, and power struggles. I got to win. Remember, I quoted Julie Gottman as saying, we fight not to win, but to learn, <laughs> which is a very different orientation. Power two is the ability to reach for your best self and to live according to your higher values. When I was a young girl and I had a red hair and a bit of a temper, my father asked if I wanted to learn what an old uh, Roman Stoic philosopher had to say about temper. And I said, sure. He said it in a very loving way. He wasn't putting me down or anything. And he said, here's what Seneca said. Most powerful is the person who has himself in his own power. And I was blown away by that as an eight-year-old girl. I was obviously a budding philosopher myself, which I became a philosophy major like my father did. But it's like, I wanted that power. I wanted the power to choose how to respond and not have a meltdown if I got agitated. And I've, I've actually done some good work on it over the course of my life. I think I'm getting better at it. Um, power two involves emotion regulation, the ability to choose how to respond in a given moment. So I think that's really, really important. Power with is the ability to co-create a loving, respectful relationship, cultivating the we, working on equality, fairness, and respect, making room for both voices, really, really important. Um, it's not my way or the highway. It's how can we coexist here? Cultivating empathy is a crucial part of this work. Um, part of empathy is eye contact. Without eye contact, we, we know what another person feels by looking at the muscles around their eyes. There's actually a lot of neuroscience work on this. And you have to have the eye contact, which many of us don't have these days. Um, and to cultivate presence. Um, I, uh, I think presence can be um, loving presence, or it can be toxic presence, or it can be absence where you're completely distracted. So this is about loving presence. Um, it power with also includes cultivating generosity, gratitude, positivity. Part of generosity is giving your partner a break. It's like giving them the benefit of the doubt. Like maybe he had a, a bad day at work as opposed to, you know, this person is always lording it over me or whatever. So I think that's important. With regard to um, gratitude, there's a lovely little ritual that I came across in my work with families and couples called the blessings jar. I don't know if any of you know this ritual, but some families um, at Thanksgiving, uh, each during the year, they, they notice something positive that someone has done in the family for another person. And they jot it down on a little post-it note and they put it into a jar. 
<clears throat> and on Thanksgiving each year, they take out all the notes and read them aloud. That's the, that's the blessings jar. And um, when I taught this once, um, one of my trainees said um, that that's also something that, that, that she does in her couple relationship, right? Only they do it like once a month. So you're, you're on the lookout for the positivity with the blessings jar. You're looking for those positive moments, which again, counteracts our, our instinct for negativity, which is the, the, uh, the emotional brain. I also wanna talk about making a relational claim, which is a term I, I made up once. It's about, we often think if we have voice, we just blow the other person out of the water. That's not making a relational claim. Or we think I, I have to silence myself to be nice to my partner. That's also not making a relational claim. Making a relational claim is stating what you need to say with voice while making room for the voice of the other and having concern for them and for the relationship as well. What impact will my behavior right now have on myself, my self-esteem, my own, this is who I wanna be, my partner, and also the relationship. So those, those are some thoughts about power. Rupture and repair. You know, many of us think that when you when you fall in love and it's all good, you're never going to have to say you're sorry. You're never going to hurt each other. And that just isn't true from most of the research that we know. There's an oscillation between connection, disconnection, and repair. Um, relate. We do hurt each other. And Sue Johnson talks about this with EFT in terms of relational injuries that call out to the partner to be heard with compassion. If we don't attend to these relational injuries, whether it's you weren't there for me, whether it's you had an affair 10 years ago, whether it's you know you invested without talking to me about how, where our money's gonna go, whatever the issue, it could be a big injury, it could be a small injury, you were too critical, um, the, the relational injuries do need to be heard and, and that's part of the work of therapy. Repair entails apology and self-exploration, commitment not to act like this in the future. And it involves guilt. Now, if I were to ask you all to raise your hands, and I'm not going to stop the screen share to show you, you know, see what everybody says, how many people like guilt, um, probably most of you would say you would not raise your hand. It's like, ugh, guilt. Who wants guilt? You know, that's kind of toxic. But I think that there's, um, and I learned this from Martin Buber, the philosopher Martin Buber, um, who wrote I Am Thou, there's a difference between healthy guilt and neurotic guilt. And we often mix the two up. Healthy guilt is your conscience. I feel bad because I hurt you. For me, I don't know where you guys feel guilt, I feel it across my chest. <laughs> and when I feel that feeling, it, it prompts me to think, who have I hurt? <laughs> What's going on here? What do I need to do to repair? It's actually, I think, a um, probably an evolutionarily wise uh, part of our apparatus that it gets us to do the repair because um, repair is crucial in, in, in our survival. Um, so I think that, that healthy guilt is really important. Um, I also think, and we don't have time to go into this tonight, but I also think that there's such a thing as toxic shame and healthy shame. I think healthy shame can be, I don't, I feel ashamed that I'm acting the way I'm acting. It's not just the, the deed I did, I feel guilty for. I don't want to be this person who is hurting my partner. <clears throat> That's healthy shame. Toxic shame, of course, is you should be ashamed. It's shaming somebody else. It's feeling so, so bad about yourself that you can't even function. So I want to put in a word for healthy, um, healthy guilt and shame. And as Gottman said, and as I said before, repair can increase trust, which is really important. Okay, let's look at relational ethics. Um, basically, we shape each other's, let's say in a, in a partnership, in a couple, we shape each other's identity for better or worse. This, the picture is of Escher, you know, the two hands drawing each other. Uh, as, as, um, as narrative therapists, Jill Friedman and Jean Combs said, we, I think they said, we make each other up in every moment. In other words, how we act towards our partner affects them for better or for worse. So we need to consider the consequences on the other, on our partner, for how we speak and how we act. How we protect ourselves. What impact does our survival strategy have on our partner? Um, there's a field called narrative ethics, which is related to relational ethics. I first came across this 
to a remarkable article by Carlson and Haire called Toward a Theory of Relational Accountability. It's at the bottom of your screen. An invitational approach to living narrative ethics in couple relationships. It's a beautiful article about how couples, the stories they tell about each other and the ways they treat each other affects each other's story, self-story and identity, again, for better or for worse. And, and inviting couples you know, to think about how they want to impact each other. It's a very, it really inspired me to write my article, which was published just last year on couple relational ethics and family process. So I wanna give credit where credit is due because I've learned a lot from them and from many other people. Bojar Meninaj, Ivan Bojar Meninaj created um, contextual therapy. He was one of the grandfathers of family therapy and one of the grandfathers along with Bowen uh, of intergenerational family therapy. Um, and Bojar Meninaj made up the term relational ethics back in the 70s. Um, and he talks about the balance of giving and receiving in partnerships. Um, he says also that autonomy includes the capacity for relational responsibility for thinking about the consequences of your behavior on the other person, which I think is a really powerful, powerful statement. I alluded to before the idea of relational presence versus relational absence. Relational presence is crucial for good relations, for good a couple relationships, eye contact um, versus the distraction of our devices. Um, there was research that showed that if two friends were out for lunch and they had their cell phones on the table, even if they weren't turned on, the conversation was significantly more superficial than if their cell phones were put away, uh, which taught me to put my cell phone away. I, I think this issue of the cell phones interrupting human eye contact and human presence is really a problem in our world. We often are distracted. We multitask. We take each other for granted. Um, the relationship is at the bottom of the to-do list. So this is what Gottman calls turning away from each other. Um, turning toward each other is loving presence and turning against each other is what we could call toxic presence, domineering behavior, control, and contempt. Um, mentalization is a really important part of this whole process. Mentalization means I understand that the way I see the world is not the same as the way you see the world. And there are multiple perspectives. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people don't understand this. The assumption is it's my way or the highway. What I see is the only truth. So there's a lot of room for making room for both. Um, you know, you can have a couple in your office fighting over what happened last Thursday night in their house and whose fault it was. And they're fighting the whole session about what happened. And I might say, you know, we know that memory is very subjective. That's another neuroscience tidbit um, and unreliable. Um, maybe God knows, you know, what happened in your house on Thursday night, but I don't have access to God and I don't know if you do. So maybe we could make room for both of your experiences. Could you both share what you went, what, what your perspective was? And that just shifts the whole conversation in a very powerful way. Making room for multiple narratives. Um, there's a term I made up called construal humility. So to construe is to understand, to make a story of, of, about something. And I'm trying to help my clients have construal humility about their narrative of what happened Thursday night or in general in their relationship and make room for the partner's story um, and hold these differences graciously. Uh, I also want to help as a therapist myself, I want to have construal humility. So we therapists get pretty attached to our points of view and our theories. And um, one, one person said, um, hold your theories lightly which I think is a lovely idea. Have a theory, <laughs> have a guidepost, have a map, but don't get wedded to it. You know, as I think Bateson said, the map is not the territory, right? So construal humility is I'm construing this couple's dynamics, but I don't know if I'm right. This is just an idea. So when I offer an idea to a, to a client, I'll say, you know, here's a thought. Does this make any sense to you? And if they say, no, it doesn't, then we'll look at what their perspective is. I'm not trying to sell them on my idea. To me, that doesn't feel right or fair. So we come back to healing intergenerational wounds. Um, many of us are living under the spell of childhood. That's a term I made up. We're still feeling small and powerless and waiting and hoping that our parents will wake up and give us what, what we want. Um, but we're not free to love if we're constrained by old beliefs and wounds and seeing our parents with a grudge from the child's point of view. That's living under the spell of childhood. Part of the goal is to open up and to see our parents as real people. 
Michael Kerr, who's a Bolinian, said, think of your mother as your grandmother's daughter and get to know her that way, which I thought was just, just lovely. Um, uh, uh, other people have talked about turning family ghosts into ancestors, right? Instead of them haunting you, you give them credit for what they've taught you, but they don't necessarily have to haunt you. And again, Bojomeni Naj's ideas around lo loyalties and legacies, uh, which I don't have time to, to go into. But a lot of the work I do is to help, if clients are open to it and if it feels appropriate, and we're coming to the end now, I wanna open for questions in a minute. But I wanna just say that sometimes I actually do some family of origin work with my clients, with couples or individuals. <clears throat> some of it may be just helping them become more curious about their parents. Some of it may be doing actual work with the parents. So uh, either we invite the parents in for a session with one with the adult child, or I might coach them on how to maybe invite their parents for dinner. I wanna just tell you um, how I did that with Len and Carla briefly. They're both very distant with their parents. <clears throat> Len agrees to invite his parents in for a session with him and me. His father apologizes to Len for his emotional instability when Len was young and explains that he's been on medication for bipolar disorder for years and is now well-regulated. He's remorseful for the way he frightened Len as a child. Len cautiously opens the door a crack in relationship with his parents and it will be slow. This is really crucial. I'm not trying to force him into like all love and it's all fine and let's go back to close, close. He'll have to figure that out gradually and the parents understand that. Carla doesn't want to bring her parents in. She invites them to lunch, engages them in conversation about her childhood both hers and her parents' childhoods. They both grew up in poverty and were traumatized by it. Her parents, and she didn't know the story, her parents determined that they would never live in poverty. They would raise their children with financial security, which meant that they had to have two jobs and work almost around the clock, which made Carla the parent parentified child caring for her siblings. Carla gently shares with my guidance the experience of having too much responsibility and feeling criticized. And because she's not attacking her parents, they can hear her respectfully. Now, not every parent is open to this, I understand, but when they are, it can be really quite transformative. And there's a synergy between personal intergenerational and couple transformation. So when people are stuck in old views of their parents and old interactions, they are often replicating that with their partner. So this work can really open up something in the couple. And finally, the position of the therapist. Um, the number one is we create safety. Um, my office is a shame-free, blame-free zone. So I don't shame and blame clients and I encourage them not to do that. Couple therapy is complicated because we're holding both people's perspectives. This is called what Naj calls multi-directed partiality. It's not neutrality. Neutrality to me connotes whatever, you know, I'm not connected to anybody here individually. Multi-directed partiality, I'm partial to each of you. I'm on your side both in terms of supporting you and maybe challenging you, but it's both people. That's multi-directed partiality. And by the way, I apply that as Naj does, not only to the couple between them, but also with regard to their parents, as we do some family of origin work. The goal is not to blame parents, but to try to understand the parents' own journey and experience. I'm transparent in my work. I don't, I don't do any secret zapping or, or paradoxing or, st or strategic stuff. It's all very much in the open. It's collaborative work. I already talked about neuroeducation and construal humility and resistance. So I think on that note, I will, I'm will. i done with my PowerPoint and I'm really interested if there's more Q&A, Marlene, that anyone wants to share. Uh, it is, but we have six minutes and so we will get to those that we can. Okie doke. Um, the questions that remain are, what do you make of the physical intimacy versus for physical intimacy first versus emotional intimacy first mismatch that can happen between so many couples. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but maybe it means that one person can only get physically intimate when they feel emotionally connected and the other person can only get emotionally connected when they feel physically connected. I'm not sure if that's what the person means. Would you understand it that way, Marlene? Or are you uh, uh, it well, it sounds like they're talking about they develop physical intimacy first uh, and uh, the the contrast between developing physical intimacy first versus emotional intimacy first. I think it depends on people's preferences. There are people, some may be gender-based, you know, women may be more inclined to do the emotional route first, but not necessarily. It's also cultural. There's a huge um, 
uh, pressure on college students now to to uh, have a lot of sexual experiences and not get too involved. So so that's very different, let's say, from a more traditional point of view, which is that you develop emotional connection and love and the sex comes after that, whether you're married or not. Um, but a lot of that's cultural. So I, I think that um, I think they're both important. And I think that if, you know, hopefully couples aren't fighting about that, but there are people who certainly want to have the emotional safety and connection before they go the route of, of sexual connection. And they may feel pushback on that. Okay. The next question uh, is, what happens if you ask a couple to think about the magic question and they say something like, no, this has never happened to me. Right. Uh, so what then? Right. So it's very rare that that happens in my experience. It does happen occasionally. And I would say that um, sometimes the person hasn't thought much about their family of origin or they idealize the family of origin or they're too terrified to go back to the family of origin to connect anything from now to then. <clears throat> or they're so wedded to the blame game. <clears throat> I've never had this problem with anybody except this person, my partner, and it's their fault. So there's many ways that the uh, access to the past may be blocked. Uh, and it may not be the family of origin. It could be culture of origin. It could, it, of origin. it could be that people were in a prior relationship where they got burned. Let's say the partner had an affair and now they're hypervigilant. So there's many ways that people can be uh, frightened of, of the connection, and it may or may not be from the family. So I wouldn't, I'm not trying to force the family of origin point, but way more than not, it often, if you don't do it gently and in a good timing, often it does open something up. Okay. And then this uh, question is, what happens when uh, one partner has to continually apologize, feels bad? Uh, but struggles themselves with a behavior such as uh, uh, in being late or interrupting due to ADHD. Right. So <clears throat> I think when people can face their ADHD uh, or whatever other biological or psychological issues they have, it's a big plus. Um, the next step would be to get treatment for it, right? And there is treatment for ADHD. There's, bio there's behavioral treatment. There's, there's, uh, there's biochemical treatment. Um, and so I don't think it's just, yeah, I got ADHD and I'm not going to do anything about it so that I get a free pass. I don't think that works. Whatever the issues are that one has, whether they're dealing with depression or substance abuse or ADHD or bipolar, like Lynn's father, I think the first step is acknowledging. The second step is getting proper help. Okay. And then, um, um, uh, one participant asked if you could share your articles with them since that uh, they may not be able to access the journals they are in. I heard you say that people can write to you and you can, can write to me. It's monafishbane at gmail.com or through my website, monafishbane.com. And if you okay. just tell me your email and what you want, I'll send you the actual articles. I can't, I can't just, I can't put them on the website, but I can share them selectively with people. So that's, that's available. Great. Well, uh, I want the participants to know that we have recorded this and you will receive a link to the recording uh, in roughly around two weeks. Uh, we send that out. Uh, but I know that uh, just as I did, you all found this very informative. And I want to thank you uh, very much, uh, Mona, for providing this very detailed um, you know, uh, uh, lesson about uh, couples and neurobiology. Also, I want to thank you for mentioning Dr. Ivan Barzumani Notch, who was a mentor of mine. Uh, I was with him for quite a few years at Drexel. And, uh, you know, I mean, he lived relational ethics, fairness in relationships uh, and between give and take. So thank you very much. This has been truly an inspiring and uh, deeply enlightening uh, presentation. And so thank you very much. And thank you to all of our participants. And uh, please join us for Michelle Schenkman's, uh, which will be the vulnerable, on the vulnerability cycle. Uh, um, Heartily recommended. Michelle is yes. a wonderful present presenter and a wonderful thinker. So, so we'll everybody. look, <laughs> yeah, so we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, have a good evening or a good day, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs>